All right, a very pleasant good day to each and every one of you. I'm Brother James, and I greet you one more time in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. We are studying together the Bible book of Revelation, not the revelation of St. John, the revelation of Jesus Christ. We have made our way to verse number three. We're, we're really moving out. Revelation 1 and verse number three says, Blessed, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Blessed occurs seven times in Revelation. Here, chapter 1, verse 3, chapter 14, verse 13, chapter 16, verse 15, chapter 19, verse 9, chapter 20, verse 6, chapter 22, verse 7, chapter 22, verse 14. Just in case you're ever asked, you'll know. The singular, he that readeth, is followed by the plural, they that hear. It may refer to the first century practice of public reading in the gathering of believers or believers and unbelievers. Remember the practice in the Jewish synagogue? I'll, I'll show you from the Bible. In Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, Jesus attending the synagogue as he did consistently, though he seldom got anything out of it, <laughs> and though he, he didn't learn much, and though the minister probably wasn't as sharp as he was, yet Jesus faithfully attended the synagogue. Are, are you following him? Are you following his example? Anyway, the Bible says in Luke chapter 4, verse 16, and he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, and he reads. And verse 20, and he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. So what do we have? Scripture and a reader. One man reads and the rest hear. So, Revelation 1, 3, blessed is, is he that readeth, singular, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. In Acts 13, Acts chapter 13, <clears throat> and verse number 14, Acts 13, 14, but when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Verse 27, for they uh, that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. Acts 15 and verse 21. Acts 15, 21. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So it is possible that the Lord is referring to the practice of one man reading the scriptures in the hearing of many other men to take us back a little bit to the introductory, introductory comments that we made to our study on Revelation, you do understand that in many parts of the world, one literate man may be reading the Bible and teaching the Bible to a company of illiterate men and women. A good practice if it's necessary. You also understand that you may have a situation where one man is preaching and another man is translating so that many people are hearing in their language 
from a book that they could not read in their language. So uh, all of that is, is I believe, uh, taken into account here in the statement, blessed is he, singular, that readeth, and they, plural, that hear the words. It may, uh, the practice may well have carried over into the early church and not just been a Jewish synagogue matter. In 1 Timothy 4 and verse number 13, till I come give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. I know we often make that Timothy's personal reading, but uh, perhaps it's not. Perhaps it's, uh, it also includes Timothy reading God's Word to the people where he pastored. But here's what I've heard. I've heard many, many times I've heard this. There is a special blessing promised to those who read the book of Revelation. And I've heard, I've heard uh, devotional uh, teaching on it. I've heard preachers preach on it. And I've heard people say there is a blessing God gives people for reading Revelation that he doesn't give to people reading any other part of the Bible. I, I don't try to be contrary. I don't want to be contrary. But that's not what the verse says. And if the verse did say that, it wouldn't imply that you're going to get a blessing from reading Revelation and not get a blessing from reading the other 65 books of the Bible. In fact, I hate to tell you what it, what it doesn't mean before I tell you what it does mean, but think about something. I, I, I've been saved since 1976. I've been preaching since 1977. I've been pastoring since 1981. That's a pretty good run. What, what other book in the world do people pick up and read the last chapter first? It doesn't make a lot of sense. What do you got there? A novel. What do you have there? A, a history book. What do you have there? A, well, how far have you got? Well, I just, I went to the last chapter and I'm, I'm trying to figure the last chapter out and then I'm going to go read the rest of the book. That, the idea that you can skip Genesis through Jude and just pick up Revelation and get a special blessing for reading it, you might just get specially confused. You might just get specially wrong. You might just end up specially misled. And that certainly has proven to be true. In my decades of experience dealing with people who are experts on Revelation and who major in prophecy and don't seem to know anything about Leviticus or Deuteronomy or Joshua or Kings or the prophets or the Psalms or the Gospels or Romans or the rest of the book you need to understand to understand the last book in the Bible. Why do so many people want to start where God ends? But watch the verse, please. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. So whether you read it or have it read to you, there is a blessing, but we haven't gotten to the period yet. Blessed is he that readeth, comma, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, comma, and keep those things which are written therein. My brother, my sister, let's be honest. Let's be honest. I'll be honest with you. You be honest with me. Let's be honest. If you read Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, but you don't act upon that, you don't get saved. If you read that Jesus Christ rose from the dead for our justification, but you don't act on that, you don't get justified. If you read that the Lord shall descend and for the shout and a voice and a trumpet, and those who have believed that Christ died and was buried and rose again are caught up to meet the Lord in the air, if you read that, but you have never believed on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you don't get a blessing. You, you don't go up. You could read Revelation every morning of your life. And if you don't keep 
the instructions God has given you, you don't get a blessing. This is not a rabbit's foot. It's not a lucky charm. It's not a talisman. It's not some voodoo token. It's a book full of words until you believe them. It's a book full of words until you act upon them. If you will read or hear and keep the words that are written in this book, then, then God will be able to bless your life. Let, let's, let's not tell people silly things that are just going to hurt them. Well, you know, if you read Revelation, you'll get a blessing. Not if you're a murderer, not if you're a thief, not if you're a liar, not if you're an adulteress, not if you're a lazy cheat. <laughs> you, know, you can't get a blessing reading the book of Revelation if you don't do what it says. So let, let's, let's stop pulling little parts of verses out and teaching them as though they stand alone. James 1.22 says, James chapter 1 verse 22 says, uh, be doers of the word and not hearers only. And if you'll, if you'll do the word, not just hear it, you'll be blessed in your deed. And if you don't do what you hear and think you're going to get a blessing, you're just deceiving yourself. James 1 verse 22. All right, now how about this phrase? For the time is at hand. For the time is at hand. If the day of the Lord was at hand in 60 AD, it's closer now. What if the day of the Lord was at hand at 10 BC? It's closer now. If the day of the Lord was at hand last year, it's closer now. But let's go way, way back, way, way back. Daniel chapter 12, Daniel chapter 12, and verse number 4, Daniel chapter 12 and verse number 4, watch how this book, which contains the detailed prophecies of the future of the Gentile world powers, Watch how this book begins to wrap up. But thou, O Daniel, Revelation, tw uh, I'm sorry, Daniel 12, 4, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. What did Daniel write about? Things that would happen in the time of the end. And when he finished writing, God said, I'm going to seal this book. I'm going to seal this book. It contains information about the time of the end, but seal it up. Now, when I come to Revelation, what does God tell John to do? The time is at hand. Let's reveal what was sealed. 640 B.C., God told Daniel what he was going to do. 534 B.C., God tells Daniel what he was going to do. Let's go with 534, and we'll, put, we'll, we'll go with uh, 630 for, for something else, uh, and, and turn to Zephaniah 1, Zephaniah chapter 1. So Daniel writes it down, and it's sealed, John writes it down, and it's revealed. And as we make our way through Revelation, we will frequently go back to Daniel and show you the match between the two. Now, here's the 630 B.C. reference. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 7. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. He hath bid his guests. There are no errors in the Bible. There's no mistakes in the Bible. There's no vain talk or empty language in the Bible. We are going to see that the day of the Lord refers specifically to the time when the patient, 
long-suffering God who has said to men, his men, to people, his people, for hundreds and thousands of years, no, 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 just wait it out. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Suffer wrong, take wrong. I'll settle the score. The day of the Lord refers to that day when God rises up and carries out that promised judgment swiftly, decisively, conclusively. Zephaniah said, 630 B.C., it's at hand, meaning God, God could at any moment exercise his power and bring about the downfall of the kingdoms of this world. In Daniel, in Daniel, 500 34 B.C. He could, could have done it then. When Jesus Christ walked the earth and he came on his own, received him, own, own received him not, could have done it then. When John is on Patmos in prison and the church is being persecuted, he could have done it then. But Revelation eleven fifteen preview, just a little preview. Revelation eleven fifteen says, the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of those, this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. At the close of this great tribulation period, the time that has been at hand, as long as men and empires have deserved that hand, it's been right there. God, God, you're, you're ripe for judgment. You're ripe for destruction. You are ripe for overthrow. But it is not until the second coming of Jesus Christ to this earth that the day of the Lord unfolds. So was it at hand when Zephaniah wrote? Of course. Was it at hand when Daniel wrote? Of course it was. Was it at hand when John wrote? Of course it was. And when I read the verse today, and when you hear me read the verse today, there's no doubt. The time is at hand. Verse 4. John, to the Jews. No, I'm sorry. John, to the Gentiles. No. John to humanity. No. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. The first recipients of this book were real people who had really been saved, who were sitting in real assemblies of believers, who were assembled to hear the words of God, and God had John write these things down and send them to those churches so they could read them and believe them and understand them and where practical, practice them. These aren't books that were placed in some container and, and buried in the earth to be dug up after the rapture or to be dug up once the tribulation was really rolling, and then we'll find that then the people that Revelation was written to can read Revelation. They were written to people living with John. They were written to people living when John was alive. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now, don't, don't, don't get confused by this. This is not the continent that we call Asia. It is not what has come to be known as Asia Minor. Asia in the days of John, Asia when John was imprisoned, was a Roman province of proconsular Asia. It comprised at the close of the first century Phrygia, Mysia, Caria, and Lydia. The seven churches which are named in verse 11 are located in a rough crescent shape, if you, if you see them on a map and draw a line, in this province. So John is writing 
this book, and this book is going to be carried from a real man by a real man to a real man in church one, and he'll read it to that church, and then to church two, and he'll read it to that church, and church three, and he'll, he'll read it to that church. And, and the reason I say that is, is there are people, some of you maybe, who love the Lord, sincere people, who say, Revelation was written to people in the tribulation, or Revelation was written to people in uh, the such and such a time. Revelation was written to people who got the book and read it. That's who it's written to. Now, if you want to be accurate and say the book of Revelation applies to, we'll do that with each passage as we come to it. Verse number four, grace be unto you. Thank God he's a God of all grace. Thank God he saves by grace. Thank God he deals with us in grace and the preface, the preface to Revelation is important. We have studied elsewhere, and, and, and perhaps you know this, but if you don't, we're, we'll, we'll say it just to make sure we're all up to speed on it. When God gave the law to Moses on the mountain, before he gave the first commandment, he said he was merciful and long-suffering and gracious. The grace of God takes precedence over the law of God. Now, you have in Revelation a book about plagues and judgments and poisons and deaths of all kinds and, and terrible eternities for people and devils and Satan. and it's a, it's, There's some scary things in the book of Revelation. The preface to the book is Grace, grace, grace be unto you. You see, you don't have to be the recipient of any of the plagues in this book. You don't have to fall under any of the judgments in this book. You don't have to suffer any of the terrible fates which befall the unbelievers spelled out in this book. You can be saved by grace through faith kept by the grace of God, transported to safety by the grace of God, enjoy an eternity of life provided for you by the grace of God. Don't jump into Revelation in, in the middle of chapter 6 or 7 or 11 or, or 17. Start where God starts. Grace be unto you and peace. And peace? <laughs> Why, this book is about wars and rumors of wars and blood flowing as high as the reins on a horse bridles and, and terrible, 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 frightening things. I can read it with perfect peace. I'm saved. I'm saved. When the wrath of God falls upon those who rejected him, I have not rejected him. When the judgments of God land upon those who would not have him, I have received him. I can read even the darkest days of human history which are yet to come as spelled out by God in this book of Revelation and I can read them and never lose peace. Where'd you get a peace like that? From him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before the throne. Note the eternal nature of our God. He is, that's the present. He was, that's the past. He is to come, that's the future. These seven spirits have been troubling to many. Zechariah chapter 3 and verse number 9, Zechariah 3 verse 9, is one God, is one God, manifest in three persons, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one? Of course, I have, I have no doubt about that. Could one Holy Spirit be manifest in seven parts, seven ways? I have no doubt about that. I, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, hold to that exclusive to all other ideas, 
but it doesn't trouble me to read about seven spirits of God before the throne. And if I, if I can't find a cross reference telling me what they are, I'll tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to make up something. I'm not going to come up with some crazy idea or some seemingly, yeah, that sounds good idea. If God says there are seven spirits before his throne, there are seven spirits before his throne. If he identifies them as seven separate individual spirits, I'll go with that, but I don't have a verse for it. If he places it in a context with the Father and the Son, I'm inclined to believe it is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, but I'm not going to force that to the point of arguing with you. Ze- Zechariah 3, 9 says, For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes, and I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. I don't know. Joshua's standing before the Lord, and between Joshua and the Lord is this stone. Daniel 2, the stone that's up there that's coming down here to settle the score is Jesus Christ, and seven eyes in front of the stone, in front of the throne, may be the Holy Spirit. What do you think? See, see, when it's, when it's, you can think about it one way, I can think about it one way. We'll just, we'll just allow for that. Maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Here's what we know for sure. Revelation 1.4. Him which is and which was and which in, is to come, that's God. And from the seven spirits before the throne, his throne. See the capital S on the spirits? That's leading me to think Him that is, was, is to come. There's the Father. Seven spirits. There's the Holy Spirit. Where would you get that? Verse 5, and from Jesus Christ. And from Jesus Christ. So, the Father, Him which is, was, is to come. And the Spirit, seven spirits before the throne. And Jesus Christ, there's the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. These three bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. I I believe that's the intent of the passage. Who, Who would speak to the churches and reveal the truth to them in the very last book of the Bible? I wouldn't think it would be the Father and the Son and then seven separate spirits, I would think it would be the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And and that's how I see it. But I, I'm not going to say you have to see it that way because it's absolute, it's certain, but it's, it's, it's close enough where I'm comfortable with it. Now here's what we have. Three things Jesus is. Three things Jesus has done for us, and three things Jesus did to make that possible. Notice, verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. There's the three things that he is. Unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God his Father. There's the three things he's done for us. (laughs) Is that not tremendous? So, the faithful witness, that'll take some time. The first begotten of the dead, that'll take some time. The prince of the kings of the earth, that'll take some time. Unto him that loved us, time, washed us from our sins in his own blood, explanation, and hath made us kings and priests unto God his Father, that's that's too much. That's too much. We can't do all that in this session. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So, we'll leave off here. Next time, Lord willing, we'll, we'll try to tackle some of what's found in verses 5 and 6. Hope you can join us then.